Okay. Hello and welcome to how Stay Mobile connects and standardizes technician performance to optimize quality and efficiency. First, a little bit of housekeeping. When you join today's webinar, you selected join either by phone uh, or, or by using your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio panel in your control panel of GoToWebinar. Also from this control panel, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If we're not able to get to your question, we plan on responding to each of you personally through email. The deck will be available through SlideShare along with a recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of the presentation. So keep an eye out for that email. All right, well, this is our agenda. So I'm gonna give a little bit, or I just gave the introduction. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about AWS, and then we're gonna hear from both Tulip and Stay Mobile, and then we'll do your questions. So my name is Tom Jones. I am an AWS Principal Solution Architect in industrial software. Industrial software is software used to design and build a product. I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. In addition to my introductory presentation on industrial software and AWS, we will hear from Eric and Rob. Uh, Eric, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us what Tulip does. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Eric Miranda. I lead customer operations here at Tulip. Uh, and Tulip, for those who don't know the company, is a manufacturing app platform, it's no code. So our customers use Tulip to build uh, apps in response to very specific problems that they're facing on the shop floor. Um, so today we've got about 120 customers with operations in over 18 countries. Uh, and our customers are representing a variety of different verticals. We'll get into it a little bit more when we get into, uh, in, into my section, but that's uh, a brief introduction. Fantastic, thanks, Eric. Rob, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Stay Mobile. Yeah, hi there. Um, my name is Rob Lennox. I lead operations for Stay Mobile. Uh, Stay Mobile's primary products are um, warranty and protection services and value-added solutions, um, primarily in the commercial sector through K through 12 enterprise companies, healthcare, and government agencies, where we protect um, mobile electronics like iPads, handsets. Um, and laptop computers. Um, and then we service those um, throughout the lifetime of that warranty um, across our 34 locations across the country. Fantastic, thanks Rob. And thank, thanks both of you for joining us here today. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, to move forward and, and uh, share this content with uh, you and with the rest of the audience. So uh, to provide a bit of background before we hear from Eric and Rob, I wanna give a brief introduction to the forces acting on industrial companies and give you some information on AWS itself. To paraphrase a Greek philosopher Heraclitus, change is the only constant. There are many forces acting on industrial companies that are forcing companies to change. From changes in the workforce, to a need for greater transparency based on complex supply chains, to uh, emerging markets where manufacturers are not only producing products in emerging markets, but now finding an opportunity to sell into these markets. Um, security is always uh, a concern. We have more demanding customers than ever before, and we're seeing Converging technologies come together on the plant floor. We have protocols that are becoming more harmonized for interoperability and communications. We're seeing ubiquitous connectivity and 5G is launching now. It's gonna make it easier to communicate with assets in the field and potentially assets within a factory. 
One area I want to highlight is the truth in data. Companies are modernizing and collecting more data than was previously practical. Then they're able to use analytics tools to gain actionable insights from this data. This is a valuable trend across all industries. Some of the challenges that we're seeing, um, we see the extension of some of the previous drivers like time to market and workforce concerns, security, and once again, using data to unlock insights. We see a need for global reach, and of course, everyone's happy when they're able to reduce cost. So, how can the cloud help address these concerns? Well, we're seeing companies migrate critical applications to the cloud to free up IT resources and potentially modernizing them along the way, going from a lift and shift move to the use of managed, service, managed services or even serverless computing. Customers are creating data lakes by placing all their data in one location with durable storage and then using either AWS tools or partner tools or some combination of the two to analyze that data. Security at AWS is a top priority. Enterprises who move to the, the AWS cloud achieve a higher security posture than their legacy environments with greater agility. And that agility gives you the ability to create an environment of innovation and react to market forces more quickly. You also have the, or we're also seeing uh, companies take advantage of the ability to scale their business globally with resiliency and high availability. And today we've got thousands of enterprises of all sizes in every industry who are using AWS to drive meaningful outcomes uh, for their customers. So, why AWS? AWS uh, enables this transfer, transformation in industrials because AWS has the most functionality, uh, AWS has the most services and the most features in those services. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute, but essentially that allows you to have the right tool for the job. We have the largest community of customers and partners, the fastest pace of innovation. Um, AWS provides more complete support for enterprise security environments than any other cloud provider. We have the most proven operational ex expertise and recognized technology leadership. Uh, AWS is recognized as the leader and pioneer in research and development of new technology in the cloud. So let's get dive into Two more little details here before I hand it off to our next speaker. The first I wanted to dive into was the global reach. So I just mentioned this, but I wanted to highlight it because it's it's really um, outstanding. The, our global reach is unmatched. Customers can deploy their application on AWS in any of 69 availability zones across 22 geographic regions worldwide. We've announced plans for 10 more availability zones and three more regions, uh, one in Indonesia, one in Italy, and one in South Africa. So I said availability zones, I want to define that. Each AWS region has multiple availability zones and an availability zone has multiple physically connected or physically separated data centers that allows you to build high availability within a geographic region. And then last but certainly not least, oops, where's my, where's my mouse? <laughs> there we go. Last but certainly not least, AWS has been continually expanding its services to support virtually any cloud workload. It now has more than 165 fully featured services for compute, storage, databases, networking, analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, internet, internet of things, mobile, security, hybrid, virtual, augmented reality, uh, media, 
application development, deployment, and management, uh, the, the list goes on and on. So the, the geographic reach, the breadth and depth of services, and the deep operational expertise are some of the reasons why partners like Tulip have built their business on AWS. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Eric now to tell us about Tulip and how they are helping address the needs of industry. All right, thanks. So uh, happy to tell you a little bit about Tulip today. Um, for those, again, who, who aren't familiar with Tulip uh, prior to today's webinar, it's a uh, no-code manufacturing app platform. And so a, a little bit about what this, what this means. So um, you can think of Tulip's platform as looking and feeling a lot like PowerPoint. So it's a visual, uh, a visual environment where you can drag and drop the different elements that you would like to include in your applications. Um, the difference here is that you can also add if then else logic uh, to these applications that you can then connect to your machines, your sensors and your devices. So it's an IOT enabled platform that you can then run analytics on. So we're going to be talking a lot uh, in this webinar about the, you know, the different types of applications that have been built and how are people approaching their, their challenges and their operation with Tulip. Um, but I think it's helpful to keep that context in mind. So without further ado, Okay, here we go. So why is a company and a product like Tulip necessary? So if you think about the, uh, you know, the, the other aspects of life, if you think about, you know, for example, a, a sales professional trying to do their job without Salesforce, or if you think about a marketer trying to optimize uh, the marketing flow without something like HubSpot or a finance person without Excel, uh, it, it's hard to imagine professionals in these areas uh, performing their tasks, doing their jobs without these tools available to them. Um, so the fact of the matter is today that most professionals in most different spaces have a software stack that they use, that they rely on every day to solve their specific problems, problems that are specific to the, the, the area of employment that they are, whether it's marketing or uh, whatever the case may be. However, when you take a look at a manufacturing operation and a manufacturing engineer, there's really no software stack available to the manufacturing engineer. Typically you see things like pen and paper work instructions, you see forms printed out collecting information where people are writing down with their observations. Uh, these observations are then usually put into something like Excel or maybe Tableau uh, to try and visualize, to try and get some insights out of these. Um, but the fact of the matter is there isn't a software stack that's really designed for that manufacturing professional. And so why is this a problem? So if you talk with many manufacturers today, a lot of folks will say, you know, automation is, uh, is where the investment is going to try and eliminate errors and trying to op optimize these manufacturing operations. And so a recent report, uh, a recent report put the, the statistic at about $2 trillion a year globally being spent on automation. Uh, but the challenge here is that it, it, the, the majority of the sources of failure, the majority of the sources of inefficiency in these manufacturing operations, uh, they're a result of some action that a, a human being took, right? So there, uh, somebody failed to follow the correct instructions. There was an observation that wasn't reported. And so um, the appropriate folks couldn't take action based on this insight. Um, and so a lot of this money is going into automation, but that's really not where the, the problem is. And so why is, if we look at existing software in this space, why is this not solving the problem that we're seeing today? Well, there's a few different challenges here that have to be confronted. The first is that every shop floor, every manufacturing operation is different. There's, it, it, if you look across industries, uh, the variability is incredible. But even within a specific industry, the variability from line to line, from operation to operation, from facility to facility, they're all, they're all a little bit different. Not only are they different, but they're also constantly changing. So, you know, if you look at a manufacturing operation, uh, you know, perhaps product A sells and product B doesn't sell. And so you need to reconfigure this whole operation almost overnight to adapt to this new reality. And then the last part that makes uh, a manufacturing operation really tricky for existing software is that this is a distributed system. So these operations are full of manufacturing professionals uh, responsible for a particular work cell or a particular particular product line. And if you look at 
who are the people actually doing the work, actually managing the system? You know, there's no one person that sits atop this whole operation and can say, you know, this goes here and this goes there. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there are lots and lots, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of people all working in parallel to solve these problems. That's a real challenge for most enterprise software companies, and that's exactly why uh, Tulip was built. So, <clears throat> so we view the the worker on the shop floor as the single most valuable asset to a production operation, to any manufacturing operation. You know, these people are experts in their field. They know when there are problems. They usually know what the correct solution is. You know, we most tools say about the action insights into <clears throat> a more programmatic uh, solution to these operations bear with me guys a little bit of a lag here okay here we go so while the operators are the most important asset on the shop floor the people who are experts in the in the work that they perform and who really know who really know what's going on in the operation uh, the manufacturing engineers the people who are responsible for actually maintaining and building these operations are responsible for keeping them in production you know tulip empowers this person by giving them a better set of development tools so no longer are they relying on clipboards no longer no longer are they relying on uh, you know pen and paper printed work instructions to give people information uh, they can build a simple application that solves a very specific that solves a very specific problem, uh, and they can deploy it without having to check in with anybody. It's very quick. It's designed to be very flexible. And the last part, as I mentioned, Tulip is an IoT-enabled solution. What that means is that you can plug in a lot of different devices and machines and sensors into these applications. So a lot of times, the information that you need to capture is coming from a human being in the operation usually that frontline operator, that associate responsible for the actual work. Oftentimes there's, uh, there's, there's, there's inputs that are required from different devices, whether it's a QA machine, something as simple as a barcode scanner, or whether it's information that's coming directly from uh, a CNC or a lathe or something like this. The idea is that you're able to very easily incorporate all of these different data streams into your tulip applications. And you can do this without the support oftentimes of IT, the idea is to decentralize the uh, the solution to this problem, to give people responsible for the actual operation a better set of tools. <clears throat> okay, so a lot of times when we you know, when we talk uh, with folks for on a panel or something like this, a question I've heard asked a lot is, you know, what's the what's your factory's 10x problem? Uh, you know, what's the one thing that if you could solve this problem it would release it would lead to a 10x increase in productivity a 10x reduction in cost um, and the reality is that most manufacturing operations don't have a 10x problem there's no single silver bullet that you can solve that is going to automatically optimize an operation the fact of the matter is that you know these operations suffer suffer from a, a number of different problems that all need to be solved in parallel whether it's uh, not knowing the root cause of error of defects on a particular line, whether this is suboptimal throughput on a line, whether this is a, a gap in your uh, in your workforce, if your workforce needs to be retrained or you're hiring new folks and you don't and you don't have the skills that they need to be effective in their role, uh, perhaps you just need to know where work where work in progress is at any given point in time. You need better visibility into the actual production operation, or maybe your machines are running at you know, 40% OEE, they're running lower than you would expect and you just don't quite know why. So these are all examples of the types of challenges that uh, that our customers see every single day. And the only way you're gonna get that 10X problem is by enabling the, the, by enabling the people who are responsible for these operations to solve all of these problems in parallel in a decentralized fashion. And so how do you do that? Well, we say that there's an app for that. You know, if you're trying to train people, maybe they need a training application that can walk them through their first day on a particularly complex task. If you're thinking about trying to maintain quality standards, you know, you could implement a very simple audit or quality check uh, application. Again, this could be developed by the manufacturing engineer. It could be de developed in 
sometimes as few as a few minutes, an hour or two perhaps. It's about as long as it would take to build a PowerPoint presentation when you're getting into these applications and building them. Uh, oftentimes we see people building manufacturing analytics like dashboards, uh, we see people measuring their machines, overall utilization. And a key point here is it's more than just measuring the data coming off of the machines and putting it into a dashboard. While valuable, that's an incomplete solution because at the end of the day, there's a lot of inputs that are coming from the people responsible for these operations. So for example, uh, a machine may tell you that it's down, but it may not know why it's down. Oftentimes there's an operator performing a task that's got that that information locked in their mind, and you need a way to be able to get that feedback into the um, into the uh, the data infrastructure that's underlying your operation. These are just a few examples of the types of applications that our customers are building with Tulip today. <clears throat> All right, and so at the end of the day, what is Tulip really designed for? Well, first and foremost, it's designed for the operators on the shop floor. If we're not giving the operators, the people responsible for performing the work, a better set of tools, if we're not solving their problems, it's unlikely, uh, it's basically a wasted effort. So at the end of the day, you know, these operators know what they need. And if we uh, get their feedback and we help give them uh, the tools that they need to be more effective in their role, then everybody's going to win. But who is the person who's most appropriate to make those decisions to build these tools? Well, the person who's responsible for that operation and who knows these operators the best is most typically the process engineer or the manufacturing engineer. And so we see these process engineers uh, as, our, as our core cadre of developers in Tulip. And I use the term developer somewhat tongue in cheek. I mean, you are very much building uh, software in Tulip, but as I mentioned before, this is no code. This is all drag and drop. This is all visual logic. Um, and so, at the end of the day, the process, the process engineer is the one that we're ultimately enabling with a better set of development tools. And finally, if you look at the leadership role, um, you know, we have customers today that uh, have executive dashboards in the CEO's office that's you know, looking at a glance, what's the overall uh, effectiveness of uh, machine, uh, some machine shops and then some uh, just overall throughput of different, different facilities. Uh, and they're able to, at a glance, drill down into what's happening at the shop floor level. So they can see overall effectiveness across all of their facilities. They can click a button and they can see what does it look like at just a couple facilities. And then they can, again, have these layered dashboards that can get them down uh, to real-time performance across their entire operation. So this is really a, a software solution that's designed for these key stakeholders. And so again, our, our driving philosophy here at Tulip is not that you should replace employees with automation. Sometimes that makes sense, but oftentimes the nature of the tasks that these operators are being asked to perform are highly complex. Uh, they require uh, decision-making, they often require problem-solving, um, and there's a level of flexibility that this workforce brings into the production operation that you just can't get with uh, automated solutions. So Tulip takes the approach of augmenting these employees with better tools, giving them better data, and then capturing their feedback and incorporating that, uh, incorporating that into the, the, the overall data structure of the uh, operation by incorporating uh, performance dashboards and production dashboards and the like and creating these feedback loops in the manufacturing operation. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> these augmented workers, if they're powered with the correct information, the right, the right information in context at the right time uh, with the right product in the right space, they can just do a whole lot more. They work faster, they work efficiently, uh, and they can communicate much more uh, effectively with the, the leadership of the, uh, of, of the facility. So a couple of examples here, we have you know, a number of different use cases that are on display here. Um, quality checks, uh, complex manual assemblies, job tracking, uh, employee uh, monitoring dashboards. Uh, we have our computer vision. Uh, you know, these are just some of the use cases that are uh, that are being employed today at, uh, at Tulip. All right. So, just to give you a quick snapshot of what this looks like in production, I mentioned that we have over 120 customers today uh, with operations in uh, about 18 countries. And I think we have about 11 different verticals represented there from high-end luxury goods to apparel, to contract manufacturing, um, 
to high-end custom boat making, to pharmaceuticals, to medical device, to aerospace and defense. So a lot of different verticals represented. Um, and if you look across the whole the whole customer base of Tulip, you're seeing about uh, a, a roughly a little over a thousand engineers actively engaged in Tulip day to day. These engineers have 2,285 applications that have been created. About 60 to 70 percent of those are in production right now. And these applications that have been created and deployed onto the shop floor have tracked over 28 million uh, individual processes over the last 12 months. <clears throat> and quickly to touch on what this looks like. So how do you build an application, get it into production, and then continue to iterate on this as you're tracking, uh, as you're tracking these different assemblies? So it starts by building uh, a manufacturing application by the process engineer. You deploy this to the shop floor uh, and you start collecting real-time feedback on this information. You basically take a look at that feedback now. You're looking at the performance, you're looking at how, how things are, you're looking at your KPI dashboards, you're seeing where there may be sources of inefficiency. Uh, and then you start to change and adapt these applications based on that feedback. Uh, and then you very quickly redeploy them to the shop floor and you have this virtuous cycle of, of continuous improvement. So you're always, you build something, and this is sort of the essence of agile software development. You build the thing you think is gonna solve the problem, you deploy it to the field, you get feedback, and then you continue to iterate on that. Some of these apps stay in production for a long time. Some of these apps, once the problem is solved, they uh, you know, take the application down and then they build new apps to solve new problems. <clears throat> and so some of the impacts we've seen here um, across our different customer base. We, on average, I would say a 25% reduction in cycle time is fairly typical of the type of impact that we see, um, particularly when these applications are being used to guide complex manual assemblies. Um, if we look at the, def the decrease in defect rate, 98% is, um, is, is we've, we've seen on a couple of occasions. This particular, uh, this is typically the impact you see when you combine um, uh, manufacturing apps with other forms of QA uh, and computer vision systems. Um, so you can literally poke yoke the system and prevent any errors from, uh, from continuing through the value stream. I would say most typically, it's not uncommon to see a 60 to 70% reduction in defect. Um, and that's usually driven by uh, building very tight feedback loops. So as soon as a defect is, is, is found on the shop floor, it's reported real time that populates a dashboard that has number of defects tracked and root cause of these defects. And we're giving that information to the operators responsible for the work. And so in that way, you're seeing, you, we typically see a, a dramatic reduction in defect. Um, and then in terms of training time, you know, you can build applications that you know, have videos, that have tests and questions. <clears throat> so it's not uncommon at all to see upwards of like a 90% reduction in training time. <clears throat> All right, and that's all from Tulip, um, and I'll go ahead and hand it off. Hi there, thank you, Eric, appreciate that. Again, my name is Rob with uh, Stay Mobile. So I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about how Stay Mobile leverages these two technologies, AWS and Tulip, um, to drive results within our business. So um, a little bit more about Stay Mobile. Um, our core business is offering um, a suite of service and repair solutions across a variety of commercial um, clients, um, the largest of which being K through 12 throughout North America. Uh, really, uh, it, it's less, uh, I call it more remanufacturing than manufacturing, uh, but we're, we're effectively operating 34 factories um, across the country. Um, that are all producing different types of results for different types of customers. Uh, so personally, um, as a career long lean practitioner, um, I've used traditional um, types of lean solutions, whether it's pitch charts in factories or pokey oaks, physical pokey oaks in factories, um, different kind of visual management tools. Uh, all of these things are great and all have a place. And I think you can even see in this picture on this slide, um, this is the facility that I'm at today, as a matter of fact. Uh, these, these benches um, are all laid out with a variety of visual management cues of how we run operations through this type of facility. 
Um, but if I go back there today versus how this picture looks today, some of those things get lost over time without um, constant um, uh, reaction to changes in conditions or criteria from a customer. Something that is very physically hard to change um, in, in a kind of dynamic kind of way when we're spread across so many geographies and, and decentralized. So over the years of, of running businesses like this and supporting operations like this at Stay Mobile, we've been looking for um, how technology can help us implement change faster, um, which is when we stumbled upon Tulip. Uh, so bear with me, I think I have a delay here on the slide. Oops, sorry about that. So I talked a little bit about distributed workforce already. Um, we're, we're really focused on uh, localized service, localized experiences for our customers. Um, again, just highlighting the amount of um, high touch activities we have with our end users and on the services that we're providing. And when when you live in a world where it's high touch with a customer versus almost never touching a customer in a traditional type factory environment, um, we, we have to act even quicker to solve problems. And I have some examples about how we're doing that today that I'll share with you in a little bit. So um, our customers, um, you know, just to touch on education, are, are mainly one-to-one uh, -one device programs, meaning um, if you have kids that are in elementary school, middle school, high school, um, they've either been told they have to buy a device, um, so as parents you get the pleasure of going to do that, or that uh, some school districts will um, issue devices to students. Some of those devices have to stay in the schools. Some of those devices um, go home with students. Some of them go home with students every day um, and then stay in the school district at the summer, and some of them go home with students over the summer. So there's a lot of different factors. Today, Stay Mobile is supporting over 2 million devices that are in students' hands between the ages of 6 and 17. So um, as a business, um, there's a lot for us to manage, and there's a lot of different criteria and different conditions based on um, parents' needs, based on individual school principal needs, based on district needs, um, and based on partner needs. All of our sales go through um, kind of OEM partnerships. So the, the manufacturer of the device is who is reselling our product. So we're, we're working with customers kind of across the spectrum. So again, super important for us to be able to react quickly as conditions change, um, to be able to push that information um, back to our factories and ensure that they have the tools and they're equipped to successfully deliver the customer um, uh, to our promise. So um, how Stay Mobile works today is when, when we go pick up devices or customers ship devices to us, we're, we're tracking chain of custody. Um, that could be thousands of devices for um, one location, and one location at some point could be overwhelmed and we would need to transfer um, devices to another location. So um, Tulip in a lot of ways uh, enables us to make quick reactionary changes um, to where and how we're performing service for our customers. Um, and then we're dealing with um, a, a model variation, a manufacturer, a model variation, and then a configuration variation of hundreds of different models, right? So um, if you think about what a work instruction for like a standard assembly process looks like in a traditional type factory, um, that operator is performing the same maybe four, five, even six or seven functions um, every, you know, whatever the cycle time is, um, you know, two minutes, four minutes, five minutes, whatever that application is for us, um, it could be different for every single um, task that the operator has to do. And that model could be spread across 
hundreds and thousands of pages of schematics and work instructions um, that we've uh, historically hosted um, through an internet of sorts that was searchable and they could eventually kind of drill down um, to how um, to repair that particular device. And if they're a great operator, they have a lot of tribal knowledge, but typically um, with technicians, there's a lot of cycle of, of new operators coming into the business. So uh, with Tulip, what we've been able to do is really create apps um, very quickly that allow almost instantaneous drill down to what the problem is that they're trying to solve through categorizing different failures, through knowing what OEMs to sort through to identify those different failures, and the model numbers that may or may not have um, you know, critical to quality or critical to safety alerts associated um, from, from OEM information that isn't easily updated um, on paper or in internet hosted work instructions. So um, these, these, these concepts and these utilities uh, I'll use that, that Tulips provides to us is just extremely important um, for us to be able to shift gears quickly um, and react to our, our customers' needs. Um, so I've talked a little bit um, over the past couple of slides about the things that we're trying to solve, but there, there are so many more things within our business beyond um, how to get a technician to repair something quickly. I mentioned um, that I'm in this location today working on an exercise of um, physical um, device inventory audit. Um, we, we have traditional enterprise resource planning systems in place, um, and they're great, and they have cycle counting capabilities, and you know they have the ability to do standard physical inventories. Um, but when we need to do something specific, and we need to be able to update statuses of the devices we're touching along the way, um, and we need to be able to um, adjust you know certain records that may have misinformation in there. Um, that's always a little bit cumbersome with the system of record, if you will. Uh, so just in the past 48 hours, um, our engineering team builds us an app um, with the criteria that we're trying to solve for in our locations today. Um, and we're utilizing that app less than, you know, 12 hours after its completion um, and training, you know, hundreds of operators across the country to use it. Um, and it works. And it's not a heavy lift. It's not moving mountains to get our team trained and in front of the system and, you know, being productive um, in a very short window. Um, historically, we would have to deploy people all across the country. Um, today, we're, we maybe deployed seven people to of the 34 locations and the rest are being managed remotely. Um, which, which we never could have done before um, without having Tulip as a utility in our business. So um, again, to touch on the work instructions, um, the, the, I, I talked a lot about the depth of, of our work instructions, but there, there's also the, the breadth um, to, that, that we manage through on a daily basis. Um, it, it's easy historically for us to, to host and post a bunch of information. Um, but what's really important here is the, the drill down capability, um, the ease of use, um, you know, the touch screen interface, the not having to navigate with a mouse and um, type in um, keyword searches and then continue to drill down. Um, my operator can still be holding a screwdriver, right? Um, while touching with their other hand on the Tulip touchscreen um, to find out what screw needs to come out first, if there's a particular order, or if there's one that uh, is a certain length that they shouldn't put in a certain location. So um, just the, the flexibility um, and the ease of use, you know, in this particular application for work instructions um, has been a game changer for us. Uh, we, we've, we've been using Tulip maybe uh, four, maybe five months now, and we, we are on a daily basis finding ways to improve, enhance, um, and, and deploy you know, new things in, into our organization. 
that flexibility um, allows us to do other things um, from a layout perspective. So if you, if you think about your factory um, that, that may have kind of a visual factory in place, meaning there's an aisle way that's already taped off and there's benches in certain locations that are heavy or um, affixed to the ground or pallet racking that you can't really move. Um, for us, if we need to change a physical process, it's a lot um, to deploy engineers to a factory to do the analysis of what we need to move from a cost perspective. Um, all the while you're doing that, you're kind of disrupting productivity. So um, with, with Tulip, what we can do is just enable the workstation's capabilities to change by deploying new functionality systemically. Um, and we can do that, you know, almost overnight, um, you know, if not quicker, if we didn't have quality layers of testing in place. But um, that, that flexibility allows us to um, continue to react to our daily customer demands. And for those of you listening, um, I have kids in school and I, you know, many of you probably do as well. Um, and your kid come, doesn't have school books anymore. They're, these kids are coming home um, with their functioning device or without their functioning device. So our customer demand, um, and we talked about that very early on um, in, in Tom's piece of the, the AWS presentation is, is so critical um, in how we do business today. Um, I, it, we wouldn't be able to react as quickly as we are today. Um, and with the, the pressures that we're seeing today and getting our workforce aligned with it as quickly. So let's talk a little bit about um, data collection and sharing. This is this is some of, of what's happening today. We're collecting a lot of data where um, our our headquarters location is is taking that data, interpreting it, and then um, running functions in the background in in our um, system of record and our ERP. So um, outside of the exercise we're going through today, allows us to easily track. Um, the minutes and seconds that the operators are interacting with the system. These are KPIs that historically have almost been immeasurable for me in my career. Meaning if I didn't have a resource sitting at the line with a stopwatch, I wasn't able to collect that level of granular data. Um, it was either um, not something that became a priority on the enterprise level, right? Um, or it was not reliable data because you had to hit a start stop button in some other platform um, where the tulip apps are really designed for collecting this data it it's um you know it, it's almost completely geared towards um what engineers need from an output perspective for actionable kpis Standardized work and procedures. I know uh, <laughs> we've talked about this a lot, but um, to, to kind of double click on um, the document control, if you will, right? So um, I've gone into probably six factories over the past two weeks, and I've seen uh, paper copies dating back to 2017 of maybe four different variations across those facilities. Um, we're in the process of kind of like purging all that information, um, all this paper process from our way of doing business. Um, but that's just a great example of, you know, keeping document controls in place, always having the system of record up to date, in this case, Tulip, um, and really enabling our workforce to always have the right information. You know, uh, Instructions distributed through the internet or via email, um, or relying on somebody to print it out. Um, relying on people, all you know, exclusively can be problematic when we're talking about process and data collection and um, compliance. So um, again, we 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 collect and analyze this stuff um, automatically, opposed to manually that you know you would see in a typical kind of lean manufacturing environment. 
So to try to wrap this up a little bit, um, the the results at Stay Mobile, you know, have have been tremendous in a relatively short period of time. Um, for me personally, and in, in my career with these type of um, applications, um, you know, I sometimes get ahead of myself and ahead of my engineering team and my IT team of you know the possibilities. The the they're they're almost endless in terms of things we can do. Um, but we, you know, over over this short amount of time, we, we've centralized all of our data collection. We can, you know, dynamically and view work instructions and nimbly change those things um, based on um, input from our OEM partners. Um, we've eliminated paperwork and, and physical filing systems, um, and we've generally gained gained uh, incredible visibility to technician performance. Um, you know, today not always actionable, right? But we're we're, we're learning um, of how to compare factory A to factory B, um, and as we create these comparisons, um, we we think we're going to you know see huge gains from from the visibility that we're seeing at a operator level. What's next for Tulip and Stay Mobile? So. Um, we have um, a variety of other manual systems that we, we use. Um, one of them um, is, is a kind of a, a daily management system book, um, you know, often referred to as, as leader standard work. Um, and that book tracks the day-to-day -day activities of different levels of the organization um, in their particular factory. So, um, what are the opening and closing procedures? What are the maintenance procedures that happen? Um, any you know specific layered process audits that are occurring um, across the factory floor? Um, you know system checks, um, uh, other physical maintenance checks are all captured in like this this manual, like this factory bible, if you will. And then it's eventually put it's digitized, um, and then eventually a month later gets to a central location where we're digesting all this data. And it's probably not till 60 days later till I see it and can react to what that data says. Um, we're, we're aggressively working towards digitizing all of that through Tulip so we can see instantly what are the problems happening. I'm seeing some of those things at the location I'm at today. Um, and I'm super excited about you know, what the future holds for us um, in that application. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. I, I appreciate the opportunity to get to talk to you. I'm going to hand it back over to Tom for our Q&A session. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Um, some fascinating stuff that uh, you've got going on there. I appreciate that. Um, so we've got some questions that have come in. Uh, folks, if you have additional questions, please feel free to type them into the questions panel in the GoToWebinar control panel and uh, we'll try and get to them. So if we don't get to all of your questions, we will follow up with you, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, over email. So let's start out um, with a question and um, maybe I'll put this one to Eric first and, and uh, Rob, feel free to chip in if you've got uh, comments. But uh, uh, Eric, how do you manage interactions with Tulip in heavy industrial environments? Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, the the tools that that Rob and his team are using uh, are really generalizable in nature. They're not specific to one industry or another. They're specific to uh, matters of process that require standardization and measurement. Um, and so when you talk about heavy industries, uh, it, it's the types of use cases that we see deployed are frankly quite similar. We're talking about um, performance dashboards. We often see like guided assembly. We see uh, maintenance checks. We see LPA audits, layered process analysis audits. Um, so I, I mean, they're the same types of use cases. They're just being, you know, they're being customized by the manufacturing engineers who know those operations the best. And they're being uh, made more specific to that environment, but the use cases are largely the same. Cool. 
Um, here's one for you, Rob. Rob, what what metrics did you see improve the fastest after implementing Tulip? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I, I, we we generally measure, um, you know, cost, quality, delivery, and yield, kind of like as a business. Um, but what we're really seeing is quality, um, you know, was the fastest thing to improve, um, and then stay there. Right? Um, it's become less variable. Um, we we measure quality in a variety of different ways. Um, one of those metrics is first time fix, right? Um, the inverse of that is kind of bounce or defective return rate, um, has, has dropped, um, in our application to kind of best in class rates, right? So we're seeing less than 2% defective return rates where, um, comparative to OEM defective rates are kind of closer to 4%. So, um, yeah, that definitely quality was, was the, um, leader from a, a KPI first mover um, and then um, staying stable after that, which I think is probably more important. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Uh, here's another one for you. Um, what examples of enterprise applications that are integrated, or I'm sorry, what are some examples of enterprise applications that are integrated with the smart mobile deployment? For example, ERP, MES, uh, SharePoint. Yeah, I don't. Uh, Eric might be able to speak to that a little bit more. We um, at Stay Mobile are integrated with um, NetSuite, which is Oracle's cloud ERP, um, mm -hmm. and then I, I think we have some scanning integrations as as well. Um, that that's from a Stay Mobile perspective. We're, we're looking at at future integrations as well, but I'm, I'm sure um, Eric has a laundry list as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think let's take a step back more generally, what kind of connectivity is, uh, is, is possible with Tulip? And they really fall into three buckets. The first uh, is a connector to a backend system. Uh, whether, so a connector to a, a, a database, so a Postgres database or something like that. And you would typically build these connections by building specific connector functions in SQL. The other type of connector uh, would be HTTP. So if you're talking to some web server and you want to uh, communicate information back and forth, you could do it in that way. And then the third type is through uh, like a common machine protocol. So OPC UA, for example, um, and that would be a separate type of connector that's designed to transact data with uh, networked devices and network machines. Um, so, you know, if you look at the three of these different types of connections you can build, you know, we you can connect that to, to anything the question is, what's the best way to do it and how, how do you do that? So we oftentimes will see people connect their machines and their, their devices. That's probably obvious. We also often see people connect Tulip to their ERP in the same way that Robin's team has. Um, and then we oftentimes will see people connect Tulip to their MES as well. Um, if they have an MES that's, you know, more name brand, that's, that's fine. It's either SQL typically or HTTP. Um, or oftentimes there's usually some sort of bespoke system that already exists where a lot of this data is being uh, maintained. And in that case, you would typically write the connectors directly to those databases. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's take another one here. So maybe I'll pass this one back to Rob, uh, and I'd, I'd be curious to what your uh, feedback is here too, Eric, but um, Rob, what kind of um, cultural changes followed your implementation? Um, was, was, that, was that a challenge? Yeah, I think um, change, manage it, change management in of, of itself is always a challenge. Um, so you're always going to have early adopters. You're always going to have grumblers. Um, and then you're always going to have people that just don't want to do it because they like their way. Um, we, we've experienced all of those things. I think we would experience those things um, in, in any environment and in, in any type of application. Um, but what's interesting is um, because Tulip is such an easy 
development platform, I'm going to use that development word loosely as well, um, it's they're seeing the rapid change and effect of the system. And, you know, most of our operators are very tech savvy folks, right? So um, they, they have initially kind of adapted very well, um, but also you see continued and increased adoption rates um, based on their interaction with the system, how quickly it scales, um, how nimble it is, and how easily they can see changes happen. Yeah, and if I could touch on that as well, I think change management is one of the most important and one of the most challenging things that you're gonna, um, that, that you would encounter as you're adopting Tulip in, in your operation. And I think there's really two, two primary uh, groups of uh, constituents that, that, that we need to keep in mind here. The first are the folks on the line, the associates, the operators, um, and there can sometimes be this concern when they first hear about a tool like Tulip, like it's much more of a, they, they, they have a sense that it's sort of like a big brother there to watch them and monitor their work. Um, and, and that's a really dangerous perception. Um, and, it, you know, truth be told, you, you could use the tool in that way, but it would be a really ineffective use of the tool. Um, and so I think where we really see that, that, that perception shift is when we start and we see, and we start asking the operators what sorts of problems they have, what kind of information would be helpful to them, what sorts of tools do they not have today that they would like to have today that would enable them to do their job better. Uh, and when you start taking that feedback and they start seeing it, as you know, Rob said, same day, you just they say, hey, well, I need a button that can tell um, inventory when I'm running low on particular parts, or maybe I need to notify a supervisor, or maybe I need to report the line down and, and tell the the engineering team why the line is down because this is the fourth time it's happened this week, right? That kind of stuff. Uh, when you start incorporating those tools in the applications, that's where they really give a, a lot of buy-in. Um, and then I, th I think to add on that, when they start seeing, you know, and tr inherently people do want to do a good job. So when they, when you show them what their targets are, and then you can show them real time, is the team winning or losing based on the targets that we've all agreed on? That really solidifies that that buy-in from the, the shop floor. I think there's a, another challenge uh, with with change management, though, and that's how do you how do you build and then fuel a, a digital workforce? I mean, manufacturing engineers are engineers by nature; they think logically. Um, but this idea of, trans, uh, of of using software as your primary means of collecting data and disseminating information is is really quite new to to most manufacturing engineers. Um, you know, as Rob said, most of their Folks are pretty tech savvy. I would say that's not categorically the case among our customer base. And so I think there's a, this is something that really needs to be approached quite thoughtfully. Uh, the benefits of, of having this new tool or a tool like Tulip available, um, you know, the, you know how, what, what are the gains that you expect to get out of it? How are you gonna be employing it? You know, and how are you going to be giving people the support that they need? And I think that, you know, just to touch on this point generally, you know, Rob and his team have done a fantastic job of just taking Tulip and running with it. You know, I only occasionally will get a phone call saying, you know, get out of the get out of the way. We need to do more. We need to do more faster. Some of our customers aren't quite that uh, that far along on their digital adoption journey, um, and they require a bit more help. So, you know, over the course of a typical Tulip engagement, sometimes uh, our team would be on site helping train and empower users and showing them how they can use these tools, sharing Tulip best practices with them. Um, if not us, we have a partner network that uh, is geographically co-located with the majority of the different customers, uh, both in the United States and also in Europe. So sometimes it makes sense to involve a partner. But my point is that there's a number of different options and that this is something that should people should really be quite mindful of as they're uh, thinking about embracing a tool like Tulip. Fantastic. Uh, I love the focus not just on efficiency, but on empowering people that are actually doing the work on the line. I, I wanna thank you both for uh, joining me to, during today's webinar. Um, we have uh, had a, a, a fun conversation today, hopefully informative. Here's a few links for the attendees if you're interested in learning more about AWS and Tulip and uh, a link to getting started with AWS by setting up a free account. Thank you once again for uh, joining us today and please um, fill out the satisfaction survey after the webinar. Thank you for attending. 
Rob, thank you, and Eric, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.